Hello, I am Father Nick, your priest and pastor at the Fort Church of St. Martin's Parish in Doswell, Virginia. And uh, I'm so happy uh, to have with me today um, Dr. Mike Miles. You all know uh, Dr. Miles, but um, we, he and I had talked about how since this pandemic began, one thing that we've noticed is that not only can we not gather together for worship on Sundays, though hopefully that will be changing soon, but we've also lost coffee hour discussions. And, uh, and that's important because coffee hour uh, is not just a time for, for small talk. It's not just a time to, to have a few snacks and get caffeinated before heading on to, to Sunday lunch. But it, it really, uh, at least at, at our parish, uh, at Fort Church, it's been a time for us to check in with one another and, uh, and to really kind of have some important conversations uh, and to seek out advice from each other. And uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, Dr. Miles would be the kind of person in a pandemic we might be going over to if we had coffee hour and asking his advice. I think you all know, but uh, just in case uh, anyone doesn't, um, Mike is both a physician and a scientist. He has both a PhD and an MD. Uh, and he's a professor at VCU Health in the departments of neurology and pharmacology. Uh, so he really is someone who, uh, who has a background in science and the kind of science that we would wanna be uh, talking to him about uh, for advice here. But, but more than that, he's a friend. He's, he's somebody we all know of as a fellow parishioner and friend. So somebody we all feel like we can rightly trust. Uh, and, and I know in this time, we have felt like uh, there's so many politicizations of so many issues that it's hard to know who to trust or, or what sources to trust. Uh, and so it's nice to have someone that you actually know in person that is a friend and a fellow parishioner that you know their advice is advice that you can trust. And so I'd like to to think of what we're gonna do today as a kind of coffee hour conversation with, with our friend and fellow parishioner, uh, Dr. Mike Miles, about an issue that we may have some questions or concerns about that he can offer answers uh, and advice and, and counsel on. So uh, Mike, thank you so much for, for joining me today. My pleasure, Nick. I'm just really glad, you know, that you came up with this idea about doing this, and I, I, I really am really glad to, to do it. And I just want to also uh, mention that if um, some of something that uh, if someone has a question about something that we don't hit in in our conversation here, don't hesitate to contact me later. You know, to you know, I can answer additional questions, obviously. So, no, um, glad to do it. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. So, so our topic is uh, vaccination. Uh, we're 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 now at this great point in this long kind of drawn out and and wearying uh, pandemic where vaccines are available. Uh, and so, many of us are signed up or are signing up to get the vaccine, but uh, some have come to me with questions about it, with concerns about the vaccine, and um, I'm not in a position to, uh, to really address those questions, but Mike is, and so I've kind of gathered some questions together that I've heard and, uh, and shared them with Mike ahead of time, and he's looked them over and kind of amended or added to those questions, and, and we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, so, Mike, really, the maybe the most basic question, but one we should start with is, um, since this is the coronavirus, just what is a virus and how is a virus different than say a um, maybe bacterial infection like strep? Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, people oftentimes get uh, confused about these different bugs that can make us sick. Um, 
there's a big difference uh, between a virus and a bacteria. Bacteria can live all by itself, pretty much. Um, uh, it can just sit there on the ground and stay there for a long time or in the ground, et cetera. It doesn't have to get into a cell of your body to, to live. But a virus does. A virus can't, can't do anything without being inside a cell. And your body is made up of cells. All your organs are all cells that are all together. And the virus gets in those cells and is able to replicate, make more virus. And in doing so, it can make the cell sick. It can cause your body to react against uh, the virus and it, it activates your immune system. And that can sometimes paradoxically make you even sicker. And that's sort of what happens with coronavirus a little bit is that part of the damage is due to the virus itself and uh, getting in certain cells and, and killing those cells or making them ill. And part of it is that the body is fighting as hard as it can against the virus. Um, and sometimes that, that fight uh, causes so much uh, inflammation the, uh, and, and uh, that the body actually gets sicker. And, and that happens in the lungs. Uh, uh, with people that have severe coronavirus infection, so. So, so that's why they, they, um, they have particularly uh, told folks who have things like um, COPD or, 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 um, or lung, any kind of lung problems to, to be especially careful in avoiding it. Is that right? Right. There's a set of, you know, risk factors that we've learned a lot about over the last year, and it's, um, you know, on a scientific standpoint, it's fascinating what this silly little tiny virus that can't live on its own, what it can actually do uh, to your body. But on the other hand, it's frightening. Um, and so, um, so people that have underlying lung disease, yes, are at greater risk for, for having more severe COVID uh, pneumonia per se. And because um, uh, their lung function is already uh, not normal. But other, uh, there are other things too, uh, obesity, for example, diabetes, uh, uh, other diseases, uh, certain autoimmune diseases uh, that put you at increased risk uh, for the virus. And so, um, you know, they're, they're finding this out because the virus doesn't just infect the lung, it infects basically every organ system in your body. It, 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 it's because uh, in part, it affects your, your blood vessels, the small blood vessels that are in every organ um, uh, for the most part, and, and therefore you can have damaged or symptoms, at least in, in many organs. Um, the lungs, though, are the, are the ones that usually that's the problem. Uh, that's the one that, that is lethal, uh, is when people have severe COVID uh, uh, pneumonia. So, Just to uh, get some of our, our terms Right, because because I know I I move back and forth between these two words, and I'm not sure that I always do it correctly. What's the difference between coronavirus and COVID nineteen in terms of how we use those terms? Well, COVID nineteen is a coronavirus. Coronavirus is a bigger term that that encompasses a number of different viruses that all have basically the same structure. We we classify viruses uh, in various ways, depending on, there's families of viruses, just like there's families of animals, you know, there's elephants and giraffes, you know. Well, there's, there's flu virus, there's coronaviruses, there's, you know, all kinds of viruses out there. Um, and they all differ in their size and shape and stuff. And so uh, coronaviruses are a class of viruses and COVID-19 is one of those. It actually has a, a, a different name of, that it's official name of the virus, but the, the, the thing that is generally referred to uh, by most people is COVID-19. Um, and so, but it's related to some other coronaviruses that cropped up a few years ago, uh, SARS and um, uh, a, that came out of uh, China and then one that came out of the Middle East, um, Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean coronavirus strain that was very, very lethal, but fortunately it was very uh, limited. It, it did not really affect very many people. So, so those were also coronaviruses. Okay, okay. And you, you had mentioned the, um, when you were discussing viruses, you mentioned uh, flu virus. And I, I know one thing that we all heard, uh, especially maybe early on in 
uh, the pandemic was that, oh, coronavirus is, is just like, or COVID's just like, um, uh, you know, basically a really bad strain of the flu. Uh, how true is that? Well, you know, I have to admit that when I first heard about it, I thought that's what it was going to be, that it was just going to be a bad flu, you know, when the first reports were coming out. And then that was rapidly proved wrong. Um, it's a different virus, a totally different family of viruses than, than the flu virus. Um, but it, it, uh, it can spread in some of the same ways as flu viruses uh, can, and it has um, some of the same... Um, symptoms that flu virus it affects your upper respiratory tract you know it comes in you know and you get sneezing and and, and etc and then you know it can affect um then it gets into your lungs etc and, and causes respiratory problems just like flu can and so and uh flu can be lethal in certain groups of people it can be lethal in any anyone but it is particularly bad in the elderly and in the very young um uh most flu strains. Uh, there was a flu strain a few years back that affected young adults, but um, but the coronavirus behaved the same way pretty much. So it, it has certain similarities, but it's a totally different virus. And the important differences about it are it's really infectious. I mean, it just, it blows flu virus out of the water in terms of being infectious. I mean, it can spread like crazy. And it's also, it seems like it's more lethal than most flu strains. Um, so it's, it's got two things that just make it, that's why we've had such devastation. It, it spreads very easily. Uh, it spreads through the air. Uh, it can spread by contact a little bit, but it doesn't stay alive on surfaces very long. So early on, we were all wiping down boxes and all this stuff. And, and you know, and there is still Good to have some precautions about washing your hands for sure, but but the predominant way it's spread is through the air, and uh, so people breathing in and out, singing, whatever, coughing, and and somebody just inhales it, and that's that's the way most people seem to get it, um, and that's why masks are so important and can be so helpful, um, and uh, so that they can clearly decrease your risk of getting the infection or spreading the infection uh, by about twofold. Uh, so it, it really uh, protects you and they protect those around you. So that's, you know, that's because it's being spread by the air and by our breathing, so. Um, one, one of the things that, uh, that I was thinking about in terms of the flu is that we, many of us have, are, are already in the habit of getting a flu vaccination every year we, we go get our flu shots every year um you know is is that similar to this uh covid vaccination and and is that something you think we'll we'll probably just start doing uh as a society from here on out is um having get it, going to get our flu shot and going to get our covid shot every year yeah, that's a really good question and no one knows yet, but I suspect you're right because uh, it seems uh, from the evidence that's out there that even if somebody gets infected with COVID, um, their immunity, the, so they, if someone's been infected and you know um, they make uh, antibodies, they make an immune response and they've got cells in their body that remember uh, this virus and and if they see it again, they attack it right away. So they, you're protected for a period of time, but you're not protected forever. You're protected maybe for three months, maybe six months, we don't know. And the, probably the same thing will be true of the vaccine. The vaccine uh, seems to, it, it generates much higher antibodies uh, and, and, and uh, immune responses than does just the natural infection. And that's really important for people to know. That if you've had the coronavirus, some people say, oh, I don't need to get vaccinated because I've had the virus, I'm protected. Well, that's true uh, in part, but and for a few months, you, you really shouldn't be vaccinated if you've had coronavirus uh, within the last couple months because you might have a real vigorous reaction. But you should get vaccinated because you're going to get an even bigger immune response 
and that will protect you better and protect you longer. And it will protect you probably against some of these variant strains that are coming out there. We know it will protect you against the one that's coming from England, for example. It, it is the, all the vaccines that, that are licensed in this country are effective against that strain. They're effective against the strain in, um, from South Africa. They're effective against the one from Brazil, maybe a little bit less, but still much better than your, known, your own native um, reaction to the coronavirus can protect you. So it's really important the, the, uh, the vaccinations give you really a, a, a super you know, response. Uh, how long it will last and uh, if new strains are, are being produced uh, and uh, the thing stays in the population at a very high level, we probably will need to get booster shots you know, every year or something like that. But the good news is, is that the vaccines that they've made are revolutionary in the way some of them are, in the way that they've been made so that we can adjust them very easily and, and, and make uh, new uh, variations on the vaccine that will be very effective. Uh, the flu vaccines, they do the same thing sort of every couple of years or every year, but they're sort of more of a guess almost about, you know, which ones they need to make them against um, some of them. And so sometimes people get a flu vaccine and it, it only protects maybe 50%, you know, uh, whereas these coronavirus vaccines are 80 to 90 some odd percent effective, uh, most of them. So they're, they're really highly effective. That's that's really helpful to know. I mean, that was that was going to be one of my other questions. Is that you know, we've all known the person who's gotten a flu shot, and then you know, um, or maybe we've been the person, uh, and and that flu shot didn't contain the strain that ends up becoming you know the the dominant one, and so they end up getting the flu anyway. And uh, and so I I imagine that there's got to be folks who are worried. Well, if I get the COVID vaccination, isn't it just possible I'll, I'll catch one of these other strains and, and it won't have done any good? It's possible uh, that you will get it, but right now the evidence, particularly the evidence that's coming out of South Africa is really encouraging that the uh, one of the vaccines, I can't remember if it was the Johnson and Johnson, it may have been that one. Um, um, it showed that that it only protected against infection, um, maybe around seventy percent. It decreased the infection rate uh, by about seventy percent. But what it did was it totally wiped out uh, people getting hospitalized or dying. So even though people were getting a mild case of the infection from a variant that was in uh, South Africa or Brazil, you know, they weren't getting as sick. So the vaccine was still protecting them. And that's really important. So, and, and that's why the vaccination is so important that, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, people think that, oh, I've, I've had coronavirus, I don't need to be vaccinated. It, you know, you can still get infected, uh, particularly months later. And uh, the vaccine, even if there is a new variant, the chances are the vaccine's still going to protect you to a degree where you won't get severe illness, uh, unless some new variant comes along that's really markedly different. But then again, we can change the vaccines uh, rapidly. So they can make a new variation of these vaccines, say the Moderna, within six weeks or so, or uh, you know, certainly uh, a few months. So it's, it, they can respond very rapidly with these new vaccines. Mike, is it, is it possible at all to get COVID from the vaccine? No. No, the vaccine is uh, um, the Moderna uh, and the Pfizer vaccines are basically, um, they're making your own body make one protein or, or you know, a very small part of the virus and then letting your, your, um, your own body um, react against that and make an immune response. And that's, that's how you get protected. They are not making a virus. It is not, it's not a virus infection. It does not affect your DNA. It does not get into your DNA at all. It's making what's called a messenger RNA and that makes a viral protein or part of a viral protein. I don't know exactly uh, what, what the exact design is, but so it's making a protein that your body reacts against, but it's not making a virus. It cannot, uh, not at all. Uh, 
and it does not alter your DNA at all. That was a rumor that you know got out there somewhere that's just absolutely totally wrong. Um, and so there's um, anyway. Uh, and so that's, that those that's the case. Yeah. What what, what about um, side effects? Because I hear some folks who are who are worried about side effects, and in, in fact worried that side effects from the vaccine might be as bad or maybe even worse than uh, the virus itself. And can you speak to that any? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, uh, the answer to that is no, um, bottom line. Yes, there, you know, as with any vaccination, there can be a uh, a case of anaphylaxis of, 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 of your body reacting so severely that the immune response causes um, you know, a severe illness. Um, that can happen, that happens with flu vaccines, that happens with all kinds of vaccines. These modern vaccines, however, are much less likely to do that. And the, the number of cases of severe reactions like that with these uh, vaccines has been on the order of a few out of tens of millions of vaccinations that have occurred. So now we've we vaccinated, you know, tens of millions of people all around the world, and there's literally been just maybe a few cases of severe reactions, you know, where you know the life-threatening reactions. So extremely, extremely rare. So the risk of getting the virus and dying from the virus is much, much, much greater than any risk to uh, of, of the vaccination itself. And so that's the case. The, um, and that's been very clearly documented and it's being documented more and more as each day goes on and we vaccinate 3 million more people in this country every day almost, you know. So, um, so uh, the, there are side effects to the vaccine like any vaccine, the usual one, I, I got vaccinated and my arm um, got sore right, you know, on my left shoulder. Um, and anyone that's had it probably had that same thing. And so it was a little swollen and sore for, you know, like a half a day or a day. Um, other people that I know have gotten flu like symptoms. So you feel like you've got a, a fever, even you may or may not have a fever, but you feel like you've got a fever. And, uh, uh, so you feel feverish, you have chills. That's just your body immune system kicking into gear. I mean, it's just revving up and it's, it's, it's spitting out, you know, uh, chemicals that are fighting. Uh, they, they think, uh, the, the body thinks it's been infected. So it's revving up all the immune system that needs to fight a virus. And that's, that's the side effect of your own body fighting. And, and so um, that's what, that's the major side effect. Some people, you know, that's a little more severe than others. And so they really feel, you know, really like they got a bad flu for a couple of days. Um, um, you know, but it um, it varies from person to person uh, really greatly. I haven't known anyone that's been seriously ill. Uh, the worst case was one of my colleagues at VCU where he he really felt like he had a bad flu for like two and a half days and, you know, uh, just was really tired and wanted to sleep and, you know, felt feverish and chills and stuff. But then he was absolutely fine. Uh, um, so it... Um, and I don't know if there's any good evidence that one form of there's several vaccines that are available in the United States. And I don't think there's any good evidence yet that, that I know of anyway, that one of those uh, vaccines uh, gives more side effects than any of the others. I think it's really a sort of ind individual type of response uh, right now. Um, if, if, if I have the choice uh, of which, which vaccine of those three is there one that that I should prefer over the others, or um... you know, I've I've <laughs> I've heard a lot of epidemiologists, and, I, and let me just say I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm a I'm a scientist and a physician, and I've been involved with efforts at VCU about the COVID, um, you know, uh, response, et cetera. But I'm not an epidemiologist or or infectious disease expert. But uh, what I do know is uh, what they would say, and what I've heard many of them say is get the first vaccine you can get. It doesn't matter. If the first one that is available to you, get it. Because even your first dose of one of the, so two of the vaccines that are available in the United States right now require two doses, separated about three to four weeks. The other one, the Johnson & Johnson is a single dose, a single injection. So that would seem like the one that you'd want because you only have to get one injection. 
but you know uh, the others work very well too. Maybe slightly better than the Johnson and Johnson, but probably not significantly better. It's very, it's you know a tiny little difference. So, um, uh, so any vaccine you can get is the one that you want, and um, it, it really is. Um, and uh, um, let's see, I can't remember was something else I was going to mention there, but I forgot. <laughs> so uh, let me uh, let me ask you. Let's let's say I, I go and I get uh, vaccinated. You know, can I still get COVID after that? And uh, can I still be a carrier of COVID? That is, can can I? Even if I don't get it, can I still say bring it home to my family if they haven't been vaccinated? Yeah, that's a really good question, and um, you can still get infected. Okay, it's clear. Like uh, just this last week or two, there was a, a basketball coach of the University of Connecticut women's basketball team, and he had just gotten his second vaccination, um, uh, and um, and he got he turned COVID positive. They were testing him. He wasn't symptomatic. He had no symptoms, but they tested him because they had to test him going into the NCAA tournaments. And he wound up COVID positive. So he clearly had been infected. It wasn't the vaccine. The vaccine does not make a COVID test positive. So that's one thing. A, a vaccine will not give uh, will not interfere with you being tested uh, for COVID. Okay. So that's. Uh, particularly the PCR test. The, the, the PCR tests do not cross-react uh, with these vaccines at all. Um, so he was positive. So clearly he'd been infected. But what we're finding, I think, and the data is still not totally in, um, that people, some people are getting infected, but they're not getting sick. They're, they're turning COVID positive, but they're not having any symptoms. So they're not, and they're certainly not getting seriously ill and they're not dying. They're not winding up in the hospital, you know. Um, so even if they've gotten um, uh, uh, gotten the virus, uh, they're not getting a severe infection at all. But can they infect other people? That's the question we don't know the answer to yet. My bet, and, and what I've heard from uh, some infectious disease experts, is that that they would be much less likely to infect anyone else, even if they were infected, because what happens is. For you to be able to infect someone else, there's two things that, that need to happen. You, would, you need to have the virus, or three things. You need to be having a lot of virus that you're exhaling, and you need to be close to someone, and you need to be close to them a, a, for a longer period of time, not just a few minutes. So, you know, there's that classic thing early on in the epidemic where there was this group, uh, a choir, and they were in a room or something together. They were singing, so they were ex exhaling a lot of air, and they were in a closed space, and a huge number of them got infected and got very sick and died. Uh, that's because they got huge amounts of virus, because they were in a closed space. They had no masks on. They were all exhaling. They were around each other for a long period of time. And that's just the perfect setup uh, for, um, for spread of the virus and severe uh, spread of the virus. So if the vaccine is decreasing your infection and, and you're maybe not making as much virus, then probably you're not as likely to infect other people, even if you have the virus. So that's the hope, uh, but it's not proven yet. And But that, that's why it's still important to wear a mask even after getting vaccinated. Because if you wear the mask, one, it, it lowers your chance of getting infected. And secondly, it if you do get infected, even if you have a, you're not even, you don't even know you're infected, it lowers your chance of spreading it to someone else. So that's where the masks are still really important right now. Now, maybe in six months or three months, maybe we'll have so many people vaccinated. That's the hope that, you know, we can say the masks, you know, unless you're in a small room with strangers, you know, and, you know, then it would still be necessary to wear masks maybe for the next, you know, six months or something, but maybe, who knows, in three months we can, we can be together if everybody's vaccinated and we won't need masks, uh, but the CDC we're not, has not already, there yet. Okay. The, so the CDC has already said that if, if you've got, say, two people who've been vaccinated, they could meet and not, not have to be masked, Right. 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 Yeah, that's what I did yesterday for the first time in my office at VCU. One of my postdocs in my lab has been vaccinated. I've been vaccinated. 
And so we just sat there in my office. We opened the door, you know, so there was a little more air circulation, just, you know, being a little cautious, but we, we didn't wear masks. Um, so uh, we were following the CDC guidelines in that, in that regard. So that was the first time I've done that, you know, uh, in a year. Um, so, um, uh, and, you know, in your family, et cetera, you know, that, uh, so, but, um, so yeah, uh, oh, that's, that's the case. So it's, it seems to be the data is coming out that, you know, once people are vaccinated, they have a markedly decreased risk of spreading the virus or getting the virus. So, so you can, uh, uh, but if you're around a group of people that's not, you don't know if they've been vaccinated, et cetera. Um, certainly um, right now they're recommending wearing masks in addition. So um, it's just, you know, it's just being extra cautious because, you know, the instances where people let down their guard and had a whole, the whole group of your family got ill and some people died. It's just, you know, it's a horrible, tragic situation that's occurred many, many times. And uh, we, so for right now, we just got to keep up our guard and um, we're, we're close. We're real close. Uh, so. Mike, um, if, if you don't mind me bringing up something a, a little more uh, kind of a little closer to, to home, a, a little more personal, um, right, right after you got the first vaccination shot, is that right? Uh, earlier this year, uh, COVID hit your household, right? Right. Yeah, that was that was what I was thinking of a little bit ago to mention. Yeah, we did. We, um, uh, Alexa, my wife, and um, and Nate uh, both got COVID, and Alexa was very sick. Um, she didn't have to be hospitalized, but she was very sick. Um, um, and I, we were all together in the house. We basically had been sort of self quarantining in the house at that point because the the virus was really spiking in Virginia. You know, uh, this was early January or mid January. And uh, so uh, we were just in the house together and I didn't get it. I had had one dose of vaccine and I was, you know, right next to them, you know, all day. And um, I didn't get it at all. You know, I got, I was tested a couple of times. The, the health department actually contacted me and wanted me to get tested again because they were doing what's called contact tracing. They knew that Nate and Alexa had been infected because the COVID tests had been reported. Um, and uh, so they wanted to make sure that they didn't want me to go out anywhere until I was uh, you know, seven or 14 days out and COVID negative. Uh, so, and I, I was, I never, I never came down with it. So to me, it's just an anecdote, but to me, that said, the vaccine's really working, even with one dose, because I must have gotten a massive inoculation of virus being right, right around them from, you know, before they became symptomatic, all the way while they were really sick, you know, um, or while particularly Alexa was really sick. So, uh, so that certainly made me a real, I was already, but that made me a real believer in these vaccines. <laughs> Well, how are how are Nate and Alexa doing now? The, uh, Nate's doing fine. He recovered very rapidly uh, from it overall. Alexa is still having some uh, some side effects of with her her hearing uh, ringing in her ears and her sense of taste and smell uh, are still uh, knocked down a good bit. So they're getting they're coming back, but they're still uh, but all the other symptoms that she had went away and. Um, uh, uh, and uh, she had other things. There are, that's something that people don't realize that you know, maybe you should mention that the virus can cause a variety of symptoms. Like I said, it can affect the blood vessels in every organ. And so some people get muscle aches and joint pains and back pain is very common. Alexa had very bad back pain. That may have been her first symptom was back pain. Uh, and then she got a headache and then she started uh, feeling feverish and having a, a runny nose, et cetera. So, or something like that. And, and, um, so it, it uh, and that back pain stayed there a long time, um, uh, for example. And so um, uh, there's, and some people report, uh, you know, headaches or um, uh, the sense of smell and, and taste that are, are diminished for long periods of time. Uh, and other people have this uh, feeling like they've, they're just not able to concentrate as well, you know, and stuff like that. Um, Nate and Alexa didn't have that problem really. Um, 
and uh, but some people report that. So there's a whole group of symptoms from the virus that can some of them can last for for months that that people have had them, and so this is one frankly, excuse my language, one heck of a virus. I mean, it, it, I'll use heck instead of what I was going to say. <laughs> this this is one heck of a virus, and it. It, it not only kills people, but it can make people sick for long periods of time. Yeah, well, uh, thank, thank you for sharing that, that um, both the information and the, uh, the anecdotal uh, story that I think really does kind of help us see in a real life scenario how the vaccine can, can help out and, and protect us. I, I wonder, um, I've kind of exhausted my questions. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention or just kind of any last thoughts or, or advice uh, for your fellow parishioners uh, about the vaccination or about the, the virus? Um, I think we touched on a lot of it, but I just wanna reiterate because people have this, well, you know, question about uh, wearing masks and what they can do after they've been vaccinated and stuff. and. I just want to reiterate that that um, you know we are going to be able to start resuming some more normal uh, life for sure. If everybody we we have to get a lot of people vaccinated. We got to get eighty percent of the of the population vaccinated. We that's why it's so important that everybody get vaccinated and and you tell everyone that you know to get vaccinated. I mean everyone you know, yeah you know ask them have you been vaccinated? Why not? You know. You know, obviously, I'm not going to argue with someone about it, but I will tell people the facts and try and suggest to them that it would be good for them, and it'd be good for your family, and it'd be good for your neighbors and and your country, basically, to get vaccinated. Because if we can get 80% of the population vaccinated, then the virus can't spread. And, and if if we do wind up with three or four cases that crop up in Ashland, they can identify them and they can identify all their contacts and they can quarantine them and the virus cannot live without infecting someone, it will die. So that's why it's so important to have a high number of people vaccinated and protected. And until we get that number of people vaccinated, the masks can really help decrease the spread as well. So that combination of you know, those public health measures um, you know, staying away from large groups, wearing the mask, washing your hands, those are still really important until we reach that point where we've really knocked it down to that degree. And then finally, we can, we can start to really resume more normal activities without these measures. Uh, but until then, I mean, we might be able to start resuming more normal activities, but still, you know, use the mask when we're in closed rooms and stuff until we get everybody vaccinated. And that's why it's so important uh, because that's how you fight this kind of infectious disease. You, you, uh, a virus has to infect people. It can't live on its own. You know, most of them cannot live for very long at all if they're not in, in a host. Um, and um, so, you know, um, it, it's really uh, important that, that people uh, um, uh, get vaccinated and use these other measures uh, for now as well, so. Dr. Miles, thank you so much for your time and for your counsel in this uh, important decision people are having to make at this time. Sure, Nick, glad to. And as I said, if anyone has other questions that maybe we didn't touch upon, they can feel free to contact me, um, you know, or, or something, okay? Sounds good, thanks so much, take care. Okay, okay.